I've got a baked potato in the oven. Well, that sounds like the start of a Bessie Smith song. <laughs> it, it seems to me to be um, kind of perfect to put a baked potato in the oven, do the gig, the end of the gig, you get your baked potato. I think I think it's the height of civilization. myself. Me too. So baked potato, a glass of wine, you know. I think that's great. <laughs> I think that's just, I think yeah. that's just lovely. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not allowing myself alcohol until afterwards. Oh, that's um, good. No, not at all. I was just, I, I, I discovered I was away recently for the weekend and I drank a couple of glasses of wine. I don't drink very much. My cheeks turned into clown woman cheeks. So really? I thought, okay, I'm rosy enough. I'm not going to have clown cheeks. Ah, ah, you are rosy. You are rosy. <laughs> Got a very nice complexion. <laughs> Thank you, to my mother and my grandmother. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my sister, who's on, has said, um, "Thanks for the link." She's on the whiskey. Oh, good for well, her. I hope it's Talisker because you know I think we all know Talisker is the one. You know, I've got my very own whiskey, Macker's Malt. You did get it. Yes. Oh, well, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, but it sold out within in yeah, a very short like, space of time. Yeah, I should get the bottle to show you. But, um, oh, I want I to see the label. I want to see... Shall I go and get, I... I'll go and get it. Hold on, two secs. I think we, need, we all need to see the Macca's malt. Definitely. <laughs> How cool is that? I know Simon Armitage gets some um, sherry, Laureate sherry. But um, I think the Macca's malt is somehow a more lively affair. Especially, yeah. Yeah, so just to remind you, I can't hear you unless I've got Ariana Colby Unless I've got these earphones in because they make the sound better. <laughs> They're back on. So here it is. Can you see it? <laughs> <laughs> Here's to you. Oh wow. <laughs> and uh it's um That's yeah. huge. Yeah, yeah. That is a sizable bottle. Yeah, it's a proper bottle, and I actually got to do the tasting. It looks pretty is... full to me. You've well, been quite, you've been quite abstemious. No, this is the this is the third of the ones that I got. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, this one shouldn't be open at all. This was meant to be saved without opening, and I just thought, oh, the hell with it, you know. What can you do? It was mm -hmm. calling to you. Mm -hmm. And is it lovely? Does it taste delicious? Yeah, well, I picked it myself. I had to do lots of tastings, and so yes. It oh, how hard! I know. A terrible really job. <laughs> it was the hardest job I've ever had to do in my life. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Lots, did... of, lots of tiny bottles arrived very pleasingly in the post. Sample bottles. Do you think Simon gets that with the lorry, with the sherry? No. 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 I think I it sounds it... much more fun in Scotland. Well, it doesn't happen in Scotland. It's just that I asked a distillery if they would do it and I got distilleries to bid. So okay. there was nothing. The Scottish macro gets nothing at all. Uh, and then I just thought, well, the English uh, laureate gets uh, sherry. Yeah. So, so why can't... We... And then I asked, I got in touch with the Scots Malt Whiskey Society myself. And, uh, and then I thought it would be nice if they did one for Liz Lockhead and one for Edwin Morgan. And then people would actually be able to collect all... All that's, of them going that's, forward. That's fantastic. <laughs> that's really fantastic. So that's cool. proactive poet, if ever I've come across one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Right. Well, I think we are about ready to start, and hopefully, everyone is in who needs to be in. So, uh, I'm Naomi Jaffa. Um, it probably says it, um, and I'm a trustee of the Cut Arts Centre in Halesworth in Suffolk, and it's my huge pleasure to welcome everybody to this evening's Cut Conversation. Um, we introduced these series of conversations with writers at the beginning of the first lockdown last year as a way of keeping in touch with our audiences, even though the theatre doors had to remain closed. And I know we've got people from all over the world joining us this evening, um, all over the UK, of course, Scotland, Yorkshire, Cornwall, I know, but internationally. So we've got friends here from Canada and South Africa and the island of Spetses in Greece. And if you're watching from Suffolk or Norfolk, you already know that the Cut Arts Centre is just a fabulous place. And we are so grateful for all the support that you've given us. And if you feel like being generous tonight and donating, please do. Thank you so much. Um, 
couple of housekeeping notes. Please make sure your microphone's muted and your camera's off. We mm. will override that if it's not the case. The thing is, we're recording this session to upload to the Cuts YouTube channel, and so we just don't want any unwanted interruptions. So thank you very much. Um, rest assured that the recorded version that we'll be uploading will be the speaker only version. So you won't be seen in your Zoom box. Um, we would love there to be a bit of time where we're going to make time at the end for a few questions. If you'd like to put any in the chat, I will do my best to um, have three brains going at the same time. Forgive me if I miss you or if we don't have time for everybody's. So I've actually known Jackie Kay since the start of the 1990s uh, when her first publication, The Adoption Papers, burst onto the poetry scene. I just missed her. She read, I think, the year before I started working at the Albra Poetry Festival. Um, but I've made up for that since, and we've had some fantastic um, events together. Um, in the last 30 years, her productivity, range, and popularity have never dimmed. Her first novel, Trumpet, won the Guardian Fiction Prize. Her often simultaneously funny and sad short stories leap off the page. Her prose memoir, Red Dust Road, about meeting her Nigerian birth father, and she's just told me she's adapting this for a film, is unputdownable. And she's also written brilliantly for the theatre and children. Um, but first and foremost, Jackie Kay is a poet, and she says she learned to write through the writing of poems. So, Jackie, could we start by you introducing and reading us a poem? Yes. Uh, hello. It's lovely. It's lovely to be here. This is um, a Lang Promise, um, and it's really a, a, a poem written in Old Scots um, about loving somebody, whatever the eventuality. And there's a lot of Old Scottish words in here that some of you might not understand, but that's life. <laughs> so this is um, a, Lang, a Lang Promise. Whether the weather be dreech or fair, my love, if good times greet us, or we hate to face the worst. A hint and a four, what will happen to us? Blind in the present, eyes open to the furore, unkempt or purging, suddenly poor or poorly, peely wally or in fine fettle, belled or frosty, calm as a ghoul or in a fiery fairy, in dark December, in springy spring weather, doing by the barrows, by the Champ Elysee at midnight, first licht, whether the moon be ruined or crescent, and ye be of soon mind or absent, I'll take your trusty hand and lead you over the hall, hame, my darling. I'll carry my lantern and door defend you again, only foe. And whilst there's breath in me, I'll blow it into ye, for ye are my true love. The bonny face I see afore me. Nix, I fall into slumber. It's ye swimming up in all your glory, your blitheness, your passion. You'll be mine new until the end of time, my bonny lassie. I'll tack the full gid of you and gi it back and gi it back to you. A first kiss, a lang promise, time's golden ring. Oh, it's so wonderful to hear. I have it on the page, but hearing it is a whole different dimension. Thank you so much. That's just beautiful. So poetry is your main thing. So I'd love you to talk about what you believe poetry is actually for and what poems can do for us. Um, well, I think poetry can do so much. I mean, I think the first thing we can do is it can save your life. Um, so I, I know that sounds dramatic and I'm a bit of a drama queen, but, but I really Go do believe it. it. I really do believe that poetry can save your life. And I've met lots and lots of people for whom that's the case, either the writing of the poetry or the reading of it. Uh, and it's a kind of symbiotic relationship anyway, between reading poetry and writing it. Most poets are great readers and most good poets are great readers as well as writers. And it's the same thing. You toss, you toss a coin up and you get reader and you toss another coin up and you get writer. It's the it's heads and tails of, of being a, a writer. So I think poetry can save your life. It can, it can define your life in a, in a strange way because you can actually think of your life 
in poems. You could do a kind of a biography of poems and go through your, so rather than having kind of desert island disc, you could have the equivalent in poetry that would take you right back to a particular time when you fell in love with a particular person or when you fell out of love with a particular person or when you grieved or were recently bereaved of, of a particular person. Yes. So poetry can tell back the story of your life. Um, it can unite people, it can bring people together. It's often the form that people most turn to when they're most in need, when they're at heightened states of their lives, when yes. they're madly in love or where they're or when they're feeling really wretched and, and bereaved. So it's that it's a form that's kind of spacious enough, wide enough to let people come into the, the room or the house of poetry, yeah. if you like, open the doors and open the windows and see out and see whatever they see. Yeah, yeah. I, I can couldn't agree more. Um, the, the reaching out is just amazing what poems can do. Um, and, you know, publicly, you've, you've recently stepped down as the Macca. You've been a very public poet. You've been Scotland's national poet. And, you know, you've done five years. And I, I, I'd, I'd be very interested if you talk about how, you know, such a public appointment has affected your identity and work as a poet, obviously, but, you know, as a writer. Um, perhaps what you've most enjoyed about the role and if there are any things you didn't enjoy so much but <laughs> well um, it's a lovely question and, and thank you I don't think anyone's asked me that question in quite that way um, so it, it was a really probably the, the greatest honour that I could ever have was to be asked to be my country's national poet and it was really a, an interesting thing for me because for the first time in my life and I am I was just 60 last week um, so you know I'm 60 now but for the, for, for the yeah. first time <laughs> Thank you, uh, Scorpio. But for the first time in my uh, life, I felt like I belonged to my country um, and that my country accepted me. And it seemed quite an extreme uh, step to take and not one that I could recommend to every black Scottish person. Oh, just become the Macca, then that'll soon sort you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, but it was really interesting to me that that, that, um, that people, instead of people always saying to you, stopping you and saying, where are you from, where are you from, are you over from America, dear, and things like that, people kind of knew who I was and, and, and embraced having a macker. And, um, and that was really, that was uh, extraordinarily validating. Um, and it took a long time to come. Um, I, it's interesting, really, that and the public role of being the macker was was interesting too. Sort of reading poems to address the Houses of Parliament, or writing poems for the opening of the Queen's Ferry Crossing, and travelling the length and the breadth of the country, north, south, east, and west, and going to the Highlands and Islands, which I, I decided to yeah. make a particular focus on. And I really liked that. That not only did my country get to know me better. But I got to know all of the different, all sorts of different places that I hadn't been to before and felt kind of accepted in them. So that's beautiful. So I remember being in, in Uist in the Hebrides and I, and I said to the woman that was driving me around the next day, I said to her, and she was in her like middle 70s driving me around. And I said, uh, I was really surprised last night to see the big lesbian turnout for me <laughs> last night. And she said, without missing a beat, I. We managed to hang on to our lesbians. <laughs> <laughs> I said, we lose our gay men. <laughs> oh. so, that, so that day I'm on the ferry, you know, from Ben Becula, and, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm waving goodbye to all the lesbians left in use and looking around the ferry for all the, all the gay men leaving the island. But I thought a sentence like that wouldn't have even been possible necessarily. That, that's years. progress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's, that's fabulous. I yeah. love it. I love it. So, um, you mentioned, in terms of other public roles, you're soon to be stopping at Salford, is that right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, 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 and you were talking earlier that you've got a poem um, by a South African artist, Albert Abadams, that, that you, you might want to talk about or, sh or share. Yeah, the poem's about him, um, and not by him, but about him. And um, uh, Salford is amazing because we've got this collection of writing by Albert Adams, and it's quite uh, it's quite an extraordinary thing. I feel very privileged to be the Chancellor of Salford and also the, the writer in residence. This is my last year, but I feel very privileged to be able to walk into a room and to see these extraordinary paintings of Albert Adams. Uh, and he, yeah, he was an extraordinary man. He was um, he, he was black South African. He was gay. He's he's you know he uh, he he was very attached to to Salford down to the north as well. So this, this, this um, poem I wrote is called Self-Portrait. 
1956. And it's part of a series of four poems about Albert Adams. I've never read any of them before. Oh. So this is, so this is a, what do you call it? A premiere. Premiere. Look at, yeah, look at the wee poem, Fluttering Anxiously. <laughs> Self-Portrait, 1956. Look closely at your lines again. Your life comes back through them. All that waiting in line. The dark, thick lines around your neck and nose. The thin lines of your hair, here and there. The lines of South Africa etched on your face, where they drew a line at you, where they crossed a line, where they threw the rule book at you, how you drew and drew and drew resistance in the lines of protest, how you recoiled from police lines, how you traced the thin line between right and wrong, back to your fragile self, bloodlines, uncertain, the lines drawn like a song line on your face, your face, your face. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you. I, I, in, in my researches, I heard an interview you did on the radio a while ago um, about faces and the importance of owning one's face and pigmentation changes and things like that. But um, that reading of his face, yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you, thank, thank you. you. So I interviewed you 10 years ago for the poetry paper and you said, and I quote, most writers, I can't do the accent, so I won't even try. Go on, go on, have a try. No, have no, 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 no. Most writers have a wee plot in their back garden that they've dug up over and over again, maybe planted different seeds, but basically it's the same plot of ground. But then more recently, you've said, quote, you've got to live enough of your life to write it. So... Mm -hmm. I feel it'd be so lovely to hear about what stayed the same for you and what's changed in your work, um, discoveries in your life. I'm yeah. the Red Dust Road, fairly obviously, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess I don't think of those two statements as being a contradiction. I, I, feel that, I feel that even if you're living a huge amount of your life, you can still be very interested in, in similar things. I think that I'm still interested in, in whether I write for children or for adults or whatever in the shifting sands um, of identity. Um, I think there's lots to say about it. Identity, landscape, bloodlines, faces, um, where we come from, what makes us who we are. I think that, that these you know, gender, the fluidity of, of identity and music and the fluidity of jazz music and identity. I think, you know, practically all of my work could fall into that, that category um, of the fluidity of identity. Um, most of it could in one way or another. Yeah. Even, even <laughs> I, could, I could write a thesis where they even stretched grandpa's soup into the fluidity of identity or a poem like it. Um, but I think, you know, we people often ask me if my work's autobiographical and it, it isn't really as autobiographical as people think um and even my mom who you know the adoption papers was really uh just loosely based on reality my mom uh, was loosely based on my adoptive mom but my birth mother in the book was completely made up I I'd, never, I'd never actually found her and um, but my mom I mean interestingly enough my adoptive mom she thought that she it is a poem about hiding the things you know the social workers visit and going around yes. the house hiding all the things and my mom actually began to think that she had actually hidden all the things that I said that she's hidden. So that is a funny thing of kind of life imitating art, imitating life, because when you've got writers in your family, you've got no idea what's, you know, not, not only um, what's true, but also whether or not you actually take their fictional versions of truth to become yeah. your truth, yeah, and yeah. whether or not that becomes your memory. And the line that divides the two, the borderline between uh, fact and fiction, is very, is very, very thin. Yes. Um, you've, spent, you've talked about how you have, you know, a kind of extra layer of story being ad being adopted, and and I find that really, really interesting that that you've got kind of parallel stories going on. Yeah, I think you're introduced, you know, when you're a baby. Um, you certainly are if you were uh, brought up by uh, an open person, somebody that's open about adoption and likes to tell your story. And I think a lot of adoptive parents, especially nowadays, are encouraged 
to tell their children their stories. But my mum did it instinctively anyway in a time when people were encouraged to do the very opposite. Yeah. Um, she couldn't really have done the opposite because her children were a different colour from her. So sooner or later, you know, we would have asked. And, and, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but, but, but I think she would have done the same even if she'd adopted a kid that looked almost exactly like her. I think she would have been open. Her um, generosity of spirit sounds incredible. I heard you talking about how on your birthday she would mention your birth mother to you. Yeah, she did. She always did. She'd always say like seven, eight, nine, somewhere out there, Jackie, there's a woman thinking about you and your birthday. So I always was aware of this. And when my birth mother died in 2016, actually just after it was announced that I was Macker, and, uh, and my mum was really, really upset because although she'd never met her, she felt a, a real debt to her. She felt like this woman was responsible for her happiness, um, but yet she was partly responsible for her um, sorrow. And so she had a kind of, you know, a, a slight guilt about that, that um, of, of the relationship. And, the, and this diabetic nurse came and, and found her that day to put the insulin and she said, What's the matter with you today, Helen? Because she was crying. And my mum said to her, my daughter's mother's died, which is just one of those sentences that kind of went right through me and, and in its complexity told an entire story. My daughter's mother's died. That's quite an extraordinarily compressed, potent thing to say. Wow. It is, isn't it? It is. Heaven. And I was glad I didn't think that she had dementia. No, no. Well, I'm well aware that after 65 years of incredibly happy marriage which you've celebrated throughout your writing which is so beautiful you've lost both your mum and dad in the last 20 months and I'm also we're all aware of the world going through seismic changes with Covid and Black Lives Matter and Me Too movement and lots of other issues as well and I wondered if if you are responding in your writing or is it too early to say? Um, well I have written a I've written a poem um, about um, song and my mum and dad uh, that was on Radio Two and National Poetry Day, which people can get if they Google. Uh, around the round table, uh, it was called, um, and and I've written an, another poem that I'll probably read a bit later later on. Um, but no, I haven't written too too much about my mum and dad freshly recently. I have been writing or rewriting Red Dust Road, the screenplay. And in a strange way, that's quite um, difficult, uh, difficult to, re to return to, yes. uh, to write about. Uh, it's very difficult, but it's also quite comforting. Um, and I think that grief, grief is like that for people. Most people that, that have grieved know that grief is a strange mixture of trying to find comforts, things that comfort and remind and reassure and tell you that this person was here at this time and, yes. and, uh, and, and things that just kind of rip the rug out under your feet and you go from one extreme uh, yes. to otherwise the other. There are no, otherwise there are no anchors, are there? There's, there's nothing holding you down. Exactly, there, there are no anchors. But I think it's been particularly difficult for, I mean, I think it's difficult to lose your parents at any time, but I think it's been particularly difficult during this, this time when we're living in a world of loss Yes. And when people are grieving all around us, of people of all sorts of different ages, and when all our anchors have been gone, have been taken away, and we haven't even recognised the world that we've lived in in so many ways, many of us have been through a strange and discombobulating times um, where we felt divorced from ourselves. Some of us have found freedom in that, in, yeah. in lockdowns, and, and have experimented and found things that we can do that we didn't know we could do, like bake sourdough bread. Is, this, is that no, no, no. autobiographical? No, no, that's not. I haven't found that. I've just heard other people talk about it. <laughs> I've kind of admired how, it. But how, I, have, I have improved my culinary skills, definitely. <laughs> how, how, how have you been during lockdowns? Have you been able to keep writing? Um, yes, I did, because I decided to present a programme called Macker to Macker, all during lockdown, um, which... Uh, was to invite other other writers on and have a conversation a bit like this one and um, to make to, to, to still be macker because I thought this could go on for months and I don't want some of the precious five years that I'm macker to be without people getting a chance to hear from me so those macker to macker programs there are 17 of them and people can can get them by googling them but they're a mixture of poetry and song and they were an utter 
an utter joy to do. Um, the second last one was Joy Harjo, uh, who was then the American Poet Laureate, which was fantastic. And the very last one was Liz Lockhead, who was the macker before me. But there was all sorts of people on them. Uh, Peggy Seeger came on. And, and, then, and we had three resident singers in the form of Suzanne Bonner and, uh, and Claire Brown and, and uh, Catherine Philpott. And they were just fantastic singers. And they would pick songs that went with the poems. So that was really, really See? lovely. So you had your song in, you had, you had music yeah. in there. It's yes. Just... And we also put together, I put together a, a booklet with, with Winnie Brooke Young, uh, who's a young, uh, young woman that lives in Skye, speaks fluent Gaelic. And I, I, I put together this booklet, the Macro to Macro Christmas pamphlet. And then I put this poem in it, which is called um, A Banquet for the Boys. Um, and this, po this poem of, of my own. And this came from um, my son uh, being attacked on a Black Lives Matter uh, uh, protest. And um, that night that I found out about this, he couldn't, he couldn't walk, uh, he's quite badly injured. And it was his turn for cooking and he's flat. So I sent him a kind of very elaborate takeaway, me being in Manchester and him being in, in London. And so this is um, a banquet for the boys, for MK, Andy, Faisy, B-Man and Bailout. When your foot was stood on and you couldn't stand and you couldn't cook for Faisy or B-Man, I ordered you a feast to lend a helping hand. For your benevolence, some baba ganoush. For your fidelity, your empathy, fatush. For your brotherly ways, some mukadara set albeit. For Black Lives Matter, some barnia belzet. Tabule, since you're all trans affirming bros. Halumi, to hail the halo round your afro. Zucchini, since you're so queer affirming. Macdus, Mutabal, for loving diversity. And the Mandem, restorative justice in a vegan lover's platter. For love, for the love of protest, pickles, bread. For keeping your head, boys, for knowing what matters. I want to be in the audience so I don't have to say anything. Oh, <laughs> that's a lovely that, thing to say. That, <laughs> that, 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 that's, I hope Matthew adores that. I'm sure he does. Well, I read it to him. The first time I read it was he, he I said to him, I've written you, you and your friends a poem. And he said, well, don't just read it to me. And then he got me up on the, you know, FaceTime audio or whatever and they were all gathered around in the couch and, and so I read it to them all and they were all in tears of course they, they, were. Were, they were all crying so I, but I think the thing that really moved them was that I knew all of their nicknames <laughs> and they hadn't realized that I knew all their nicknames for um, you know Baisy, Faisy, <laughs> Bailout they didn't know that I knew that so that was quite nice oh but I'm very I mean I'm very aware it's one of the things that struck me most about about your latest poetry book, Bantam, the amount of celebrating, commemorating, honouring, recognising individuals for their, you know, for their for their importance to you, their importance in the world, for the fact that you know their lives have mattered or matter. I, I didn't know that Rowan Dodds had died, and I was absolutely shocked, but incredibly glad that you wrote that poem about her. Um, oh, thank you, thank you. Um, really. Yeah. Thank you. That's a really lovely thing to say. Um, I think that nobody said that to me either. <laughs> so, um, but I think I find it really important as a working class person and as a black writer um, and as a feminist, I find it really important to tell our stories, the kind of stories that we don't get to hear. Um, you know, the, there's a working class movement library here um, in Salford, and it, it was one of the first libraries to collect people's stories. And it's shocking if you think that we're in the year 2021 and so much of the history that we get to hear about is, is, is not working class people's stories at all. Yeah. And if you go to, into a library like the Glasgow Women's Library, you find that the archives in there are utterly fascinating because they're telling the stories that aren't told. And I just see that as my job as a writer. I mean, it's what I'm interested in, actually, as well. Yeah. So that's lucky. But, um, but I do... I do uh, 
find that I want to tell the stories that are not not being told. I want to I want kids that are like me that are black and Scottish to have somebody else to read yes. um, stories that they can identify with. And whenever I meet other black and Scottish people and they say to me, "Oh gosh, you've no idea how important you are to me," that that pleases me not not out of any kind of a sense of vanity, but just because I'm pleased that they had somebody yes. that they could that they could turn to, and yes. um, because I had to read people. Um, African American writers and, and, and African writers and, and put all different people together, which was wonderful. But there was nobody, there was nobody around that I could read that I could identify with that had a similar experience to mine um, at all. That's extraordinary. Because my next question was to ask you about, you know, the fact that your writing connects with so many people. You know, obviously women who are gay or black or adopted, but also, you know, mothers and children, people who are lonely or in difficult relationships or on diets. I love all the on diets in reality, reality, or, you know, just the whole struggle with one's own identity and sense of belonging. And I was going to ask you, who helped you? You know, who gave you permission to raise your voice? You know, who opened any doors? Um, well, lots of writers opened doors. Um, but one of them, the most important um, uh, writer for me was Audrey Lord uh, because I, I met her at a very crucial age and she became a friend right up until she died so from when I was age 22 to, uh, till Audrey died when she was 48 um, I was I was her friend and that was really um, you know extraordinary friendship um, she I worked at the time for Sheba Feminist Publishers and and we published Sammy a new spelling of my name and the cancer journals. And so when she came over to this country in 1984, she stayed with me for a week and I drove her around London, you know, driving her to the Africa Centre, then on to Shiva and then on to Sister Right, whatever. And that was like, you know, I could write, never mind driving Miss Daisy, <laughs> driving, <laughs> driving Miss Lord. I keep wanting to write um, about that particular time. But one time she actually said to me, because uh, at that time I was kind of very strongly black and I was annoyed at the idea of being Scottish because... Um, yeah, I felt like I'd, I'd been denied so much of, of, of a black identity. So, I, and, and then one day Audrey said to me, you know, Jackie, you can be black and Scottish. You don't have to choose. And that was really liberating for me. And it opened up uh, a number of doors. And, but, but another writer that was really um, a great influence on me was Liz Lockhead, because it was great to come across a writer who wrote in her own language as she spoke. And uh, and that was really fantastic. But there was yeah, so many. And Wally Soinka, um, you know, I remember reading Telephone Conversation when I was fourteen, and that poem making a massive impact. Thinking you can you can write about racism, you can write about discrimination, and you can be witty about it. So that was yeah, lots lots. I could go on for the entire hour about that. So. Yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's <laughs> lovely. It's lovely to hear this. Um, I think I think what would be lovely would be to hear some some other part of your writing. Is 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 the red dust road moment has that arrived do we think or oh, yeah yeah i or, can yeah or, yeah i can read since we have been talking about uh the past yes. and influences the other influence on me a uh, really huge influence on me was was being brought up in a house of music and a house of song and i grew up uh with with a dad that loved jazz which was really lucky for me and my first um present yeah. That I remember him giving me was a was a Bessie Smith album, yeah. but um, but but my dad was actually a, a kind of a genius uh, as far as uh, making up songs with words in them. So this this little section that I'm going to read from Red Dust Road was uh, about what we do every 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 family holiday. Every family holiday we went on, my dad would drive either the green Morris van or the white and grey Triumph Herald, or the blue Volkswagen Beetle. We always got beaten down second-hand cars that lasted a couple of years. Whether we drove down to Devon or Campbelltown, or up to Loch Inver or Torridon, my dad would keep us entertained. Maxie or I would shout out a word, and my dad would sing a song with that word in it. No matter how complicated the word, he always found a song. Once I shouted, motor car, thinking you'll never find a song with motor car in it, but he burst into singing Johnson's Motor Car. The soundtrack to our holidays was my dad singing and my mum joining in. We've sung our way all over Scotland. I remember shouting out road on the way to Avi Lochen, driving my favourite of the second-hand cars to lovely Austin, Cambridge, and my dad singing The Road to Dundee. 
Cold winter was howling over moor and over mountain, and wild was the surge of the dark rolling sea. When I met a book daybreak, a bonny young lassie who asked me their roads and the miles to Dundee. And sometimes he'd think of more than one song with a word in it, so he'd go straight into it's a quarter to three. There's no one in the place except you and me. So give me one for my baby and one more for the roads. <laughs> and, and when we shouted encyclopedia, he sang, oh, Lydia, oh, Lydia, the encyclopedia, the queen of tattoo, an old Marx Brothers song. And when we shouted oil can, he sang, oh, the sun shines bright in my oil Kentucky home. To gales of laughter. <laughs> that's oh, genius, isn't it? Genius. That Dear is, God. That Dear is God. that's worthy of Cole Porter any day. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. That, that's yeah. just fantastic. I I love that. Funnily enough, his favorite song to sing was Cole Porter's Brush Up Your Shakespeare. You had that, that on Desert Island Discs, didn't yes, you? Yes, yeah. And one time he came to uh, a reception that the First Minister had in her house at the Edinburgh Festival. And he came to that and sang it in the First Minister's house. And that's on YouTube. You can get my dad singing in the First Minister laughing <laughs> admiringly <laughs> if you type it into YouTube. But, um, yeah, it was, really, uh, it was really lovely. I think that was his finest hour with his, with yeah. his walking stick. And, yeah. Yeah. There's, and, your, and parents, your parents are famous. I mean, you know, the obituary and, you know, about your dad was wonderful. And they were, they were kind of the best people you could have ever been with it sounds like and it was entirely mutual it's a beautiful thing yeah I think that um, I would have chosen them yeah um, you know since yeah. I found my birth mother and my birth father I would have even more resolutely chosen them yeah um but yeah I, I, I would you know if I'd ever had the choice which you don't get but yes it felt like we were all fated to be together yeah. and in yeah. fact one time when my mum was in the hospital a couple of years ago um I was just leaving she said to me here come here you do you know where you're from? And I said, <laughs> what's going to come now? So I said, I said, no, mum, where? And she said, my womb. And, then, and I went back and told this to my dad. And I thought, he'd, you know, I thought you'd think, you know, you'd say something or other. And he went, aye, she's quite bloody, right? Oh, I love it. <laughs> and I love that. It just kind of, you know, just transcend it all. DNA, blood, biology, none of it matters. Yes, she's yeah. quite bloody, right? Because yes. The, yeah. the, the closeness was so close. That, yes. You know, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So, just to swerve away from so much in the heart, I heard you say you're not a natural novelist. You don't believe you are, and you mm. find the whole business of writing novels really difficult. And and yet, you know, obviously, Trumpet is a triumph. And I I was interested in in what you find the challenges are if it's not too painful to talk about <laughs> writing a novel and why you're so determined to do it because I know you're working on is it called bystander yeah yes yeah. yeah 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 actually talking about writing a novel is more painful than talking about being recently bereaved Fine. <laughs> <And that's not laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> that has to be my best joke for some time though. I think that's very good <laughs> I set it up well you set it up brilliantly you set it up brilliantly <laughs> set him up Joe yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think that I think it's true that I'm not an actual novelist. I don't say that out of any sort of uh, false modesty or, or anything. I just think it, it is actually the truth that yeah. you know I know lots of novelists, and I've got very good friends uh, that are novelists um, for whom the form comes in a different different way. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, it just doesn't to me. I do get ideas, and then and then. Uh, and I, I think I just don't lead or I haven't led the kind of life that, that I need to live in order to write novels. Because for me, writing a novel means shutting myself off from the world, locking myself up in a cellar or an attic somewhere where there's no natural daylight. No, I'm, I'm just joking. <laughs> no distractions. <laughs> no distractions. You can't just, stop you know, and start. No, whereas poetry and short stories and other forms are more are more portable and you can stop and start whereas novels I kind of plan out whole mm -hmm. and the same with Red Dust Road was like a novel for me so mm -hmm. that was just as difficult to write as a novel in a sense because yeah. I had to plan out the whole structure of it on a wall chart you know if in doubt get some stationery um, but absolutely yeah I think I think I will write the the bystander definitely and I'm going to turn to it soon and I think that when I do write that one then maybe another three or four novels will come 
Okay. Uh, on hot pursuit, who knows? Who yeah. knows? But on, but on the other hand, I kind of some of me thinks I wish I'd never written a novel in the first place, and I wouldn't have been plagued by this business of having to write another novel. Yeah, because I wonder. Of... Sorry, I wonder if um, I mean it strikes me that your most of your writing is so much in the present or the past, and I wonder if there's something about having to imagine the future somehow of all these people in a novel is in any way a difficulty. Um, I don't know. I think it, it's it's to do with our world being so surreal. Um, so, it's, you know, I'm, I'm writing a book called Bystander where people witness, the, there are different characters that witness something that happens in the time. But because our times keep changing and becoming more and more and more surreal, it's a very difficult thing to, to write up to the moment because we live in the time of fake news and technology changing and electric cars and the pandemic and, and there's nothing really that's happening and, and the rise of populism and, um, and, and the massive uh, change in, in movements, in mass movements. We live in these times where we're in tinderbox times where things are, are happening very, very fast and people are changing very, very quickly and people's layers of skin are very thin and the ways that we respond to things are very different. We live in a time of toxic Twitter where people don't feel like they can openly talk about things without perhaps being cancelled or, or brought down. Um, and we live in very binary times, much more binary times than we ever used to live in yes. as fem as feminists of the 80s and the 70s. We, we live in, in kind of either or times, weirdly enough. So our times that we live in now don't quite give us the choices that people seem to think that they give us. And that's, um, that's an interesting conundrum. So because all of that is changing and changing fast, it's difficult to really keep up. With. So I think I'd need to make a kind of Val McDermott decision of, with her last novel, which she set in 1979 and is called 1979, to kind of avoid some of these complexities. I think what I'll need to do with Bystander is take it back to the 80s, probably. Yeah, yeah. To, my, to my lesbian squat in the 80s. How exciting <laughs> will that be? <laughs> oh, and I think once I change the time of it, I'll have the same oh, issue. Wait. I'm just I'm just going to remind everyone that if you do want to ask Jackie a question, if you type it quickly into the chat, we mm -hmm. can um, do our best to address it. But I'm going to um, I'm, I'm going to ask one from um, somebody who's a dear friend of mine from South Africa, who I think, you know, Fanula Dowling. Oh, hi. Um, yes, I do. I, I said to Fanula a few days ago, help, help. I need some questions just in case nobody asks. So she sent through some amazing questions. <laughs> and 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 I mean, one of the ones was. Um, You've received so many honours, MACA, MBE, CB, Chancellor, etc. Have these honours increased your happiness or does happiness come from another source for a poet and writer? Or perhaps a writer should never be entirely happy, dot, 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 question mark. Oh, wow, that's a good question. Um, that's a really good question. I don't think that being, um, get, I think getting honours and accolades do make you feel a certain sense of satisfaction because, um, they're, they're pleasing um, and, and somebody's put in, somebody's chosen you. Um, quite a lot of people when you when you get uh, CBEs or, or macro jobs, quite a lot of people have been involved in the choosing because these things are all by loads and loads of different committees. So there is something um, very, very happy making it's about affirming. affirming, happy making about being chosen um, by your peers because really um, with poetry, we, we kind of, you know, the collective noun for poets might be a paranoia of poets, <laughs> but, but, it also, but it also might be something more, more positive and, and more collegiate because we do all work together and well. So, yes, I'm happy in, in that sense, um, but in the sense of, and I think I am a fairly happy person. I think that my, I think that I always try and find positive things, even out of very negative and upsetting experiences. And I always feel a bit protective of my readers and the people that care about about me. <laughs> so, so even if I'm talking about something that is really upsetting, I try and find a way of injecting that with, with humour. Yes. And I think for me, humour is a kind of defence. So maybe happiness is a kind of defence. Yes, 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 absolutely. Another one from Fanula, which I loved. She read somewhere that there's been an article that says, now and again, it's said of a writer that a few favourite recurring words will serve to construct his or her whole world. So, she, you know, the writer cites Jane Austen and you could pay attention to elegant, amiable and fortune or P.G. Woodhouse, imposter, pig and aunt or Raymond Chandler, blonde, revolver, gumshoe. I wondered if you were aware, because you're a poet, so you know all the words you use, of particular words that you 
you just love putting in your poems? Yeah, I really particularly love putting in old Scots words, like um, the words that are in A Lang Promise that we that we began with. I like the, the, the word deep. I like the words blether. I like how onomatopoeic a lot of um, words are. I like a word like glacet, which means um, gormless, I guess, is the nearest English equivalent. It means a face empty of all intelligence. <laughs> Glake it, yeah, glake it, and I like wabbit, which means absolutely exhausted, feeling absolutely wabbit. Um, so I like I like those 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 words, and I like to learn different words from whatever place I go to, and not just the words, um, but the intonation, the accents, and the way that they're they're pronounced. I like syntax. I like the fact that if you say a single sentence, you get a lot about somebody. So when I met my birth father, and he said to me about his young wife, God in his wisdom, has provided somebody for my sex drive. I love the structure of that sentence because, <laughs> because you've got a phrase like, in his wisdom, in parenthesis, and, uh, and, it, and it's a shock. So I like, I like sentences, I guess, that do, that do something like, that, that make you really think, yes. um, like, I was, like I was saying earlier. But as for weak words, there will be words which I use again and again, and I'm not aware that I do. And I would love to find those out and stop using them post haste. I remember going into school once where the, the teacher said that I used cherry blossom a lot and I, I wasn't aware of it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he said, is this to do with the Japanese sign of regeneration? And I said, no, it's only tree I know the name of. <laughs> <laughs> Use we. It's a lot of little. We, oh, okay. everyone Scottish uses we. That's just like, but, I don't know. That's just like. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, you yeah. can't not use we if you're Scottish. No, you no. have to tie your hands behind your back. No, no, we're not doing that. We're definitely not doing that. So um, I, I've also got a, a series, if I can find them somewhere, of. Um, yes, here we go. Um, we used to do this in the poetry paper. So we aren't stealing Simon's idea from his podcast of the either or. But I'm wondering when you sit down to write what your most natural default settings are between meaning or mystery. Oh, what my natural de- default well, settings are, you, what, yes. what I prefer most. Um, mis- mystery, 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 always mystery. Yeah. Flamboyance or plainness? Plainness. I or we? I. I like the I voices. Yeah. Consideration or confrontation? Confrontation. Fantastic. Right. Um, We have one more question that's come in from Alana. Um, She wonders, it's a serious question, what meaning does poetry have to societies? Does poetry only touch people or has it changed social services, the adoption system? So, for example, does poetry about domestic abuse change society or does it does it just give solace to the reader? Do you think poetry um, can make things happen? I, I, I think it can. I think that poetry can make things happen. Uh, I think that we have to believe that poetry can make things happen. I think all arts, not just poetry, can make things happen. And I think we live in a world where we have the consistent and continual evidence for art making things happen and not just in the form of festivals happening all over where our libraries being built or people being able to to read and empower themselves or theater being made in in the middle of war zones or or people um, refugees being able to tell their their story in the form of artistic selfies or self-portraits or giant puppets going over the, the world and, and capturing the minds and the imaginations of everybody and making people really think of what, what it must be like uh, to be a refugee in, in the form of Mala. But in all sorts of different ways, I think art changes us. It changes how we look at things. It changes our perception. It changes how we look most crucially at ourselves. Does it get to change the policies sometimes? Um, does it get to change the governments? Sometimes does it get to bring people down? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes speeches and and uh, poets. You know, if you look at the the poets that were part of the civil rights movement, if you look at the poets that were part of the Harlem Renaissance, if you look at the poets in South Africa that fought against apartheid, if you look at the poets in Chile that that that, that fought, fought against the rise of, of fascism and, and Pinochet. Um, you, you'll find that uh, just about every society that you look in, 
there'll be poets that have protested. And you know how potent and dangerous poets are by the fact that they lock them up and kill them execute. and by the fact and execute them and by the fact that we have uh, writers in prison and by the fact that PEN, an organisation like PEN, is so necessary and mm-hmm. so important. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at Amanda Gorman and, and, you know, what that poem did. Yeah, that poem was a sensation and it was easily the standout Yes, <laughs> it was a standout event of the event. Wasn't it was it? more. It was more important than Biden getting in. It was more. It, it made it more of an impact, and uh, everything else kind of paled and dulled. And there she was in her brilliant That's yellow, incredible you know, yellow. Wow, yeah. That you, you know, you go to if you look at you could look at Joy Arjo being being the the first poet from her community being picked as her country's national poet, and the impact that that had on her on her community. So yeah, I think I think. Do you have hope? I have hope. I think without hope, we're all dead. Yeah, I, I think I think hope is Black Lives Matter. You know, hope is me too. Hope is my son and my daughter. Um, these words are written, by the way. I didn't just make that up at the time, although I could have done that. <laughs> but they're in Glasgow Central Station, and I wrote them uh, recently. And they've they've kind of they they carved into an art installation because um, because the answer was what you know to, to write something hopeful, and so that was what I wrote something along those lines. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Um, I think we're sort of getting close to to time. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about, Jackie, that you'd like to talk about? Because, you know, I could say, well, how have you maintained your enthusiasm for writing? But, you know, you might as well not breathe if you don't write, it feels to me. So I I don't think that's a very valid question. But, you know, are there still things you know you want to write about? Yeah, I mean, I still would really like to get this novel written by Sander, um, just because the the themes in it are really important to me and also the characters are, are very far developed and I feel like, you know, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I feel like I would be letting them down if I didn't bring them out. I think yes. they would, I think they'd be, they'd be sad. Um, I think that I, that there's lots more that I still want to do as a writer. I'd like to write more short stories. I've got another poetry book, lots, and I'm, I'm writing and have just about finished a, a book for younger children, an illustrated book for little kids, for Walker books, which is um, is exciting writing for that very, very young age. Um, but yes, I, I think that um, I, I'll have a period of time because I have been macro for five years and I will have been chancellor for six, that um, I'll have a period of time where I just kind of take stock because I think the most important thing that a writer can actually give themselves as well as writing is silence, is a fallow field. And I think we need the fallow field in order to be fertile. We need to not worry anxiously all the time about producing, producing, producing and what we're doing, what we're doing and justifying our existence. But we need to be able to actually just think, you know, let the work come to us. Let's have a period of, and for me, you know, I'm in deep, deep mourning and deep shock because my birth father also died just 10 days before before my mum. So I have lost all of them in in a short space of time. And my mum said to me, um, Jackie, who would have believed that I would be the last one standing of your four parents when my birth father died, and then, and then, uh, and then she died. So it's it's been a very strange time, just trying to get your head around it all, and um, and to try and find. I mean, people tell me uh, that after a while, your your parents become part of you, uh, and that that's that's what happens. Um, and that hasn't happened to me yet. I mean, they're, they're there all the time and not in every thought and every waking moment. But, yeah. but that kind of process that people, they almost describe it as a kind of osmosis. Um, that hasn't quite happened yet. I'm in too early grief. You, may not, you may not be ready. I mean, my, no. mother, my mother was a singer and for three years I couldn't sing because I could hear her voice in me. And I've only just recently started to sing. And it's, it, it's a big thing. So oh, you, wow. it'll, happen, it'll happen when... when wow. it, when, it's when it happens, yes, I think, I think, yeah, I think it's, it, it's, I think it, there, there's, there's something that's so, so, so deeply shocking, really, about death, which seems ridiculous because, because we do, we do die. And my mum, you know, kept really, really, you know, because my dad just died just a year and a bit before her, and she, she did keep a, a good uh, sense, sense of humour, and she managed to make jokes yes. about it, and she kept talking to him. And so she kept the conversation open. Um, But I think that was because she's so she was so old and she was very close to that that experience. She did. She did make uh, quite a few very funny jokes because my dad died the day after her 89th birthday. And she said to me, Jackie, did I get this right? 
your dad died the day after my 89th birthday. And I said, yes, mum, you got that right. And she said, well, he was always lousy at birthday presents, but he surpassed himself this time. <laughs> and that gave me such a surprise because I really wasn't, I wasn't expecting her to be able to make a joke like that. And so she was really, uh, yeah, I think that that was part of, um, yeah, part of being in that family was, 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 was being able to, to find the, find the humour. You have to. Let the you light in, let the have- light in. You have to. So we have to end because we're at time and we have to end uh-huh. the poem. Uh-huh. And it's a recent poem and um, it made me cry when I read it. So heaven help us if I start weeping. Hope, hope I don't. Um, but um, thank you, Jackie, so, so, so much. I mean, this has just been an amazing treat and a privilege and I'm sure everybody is saying well they are there's loads of thank yous in the chat oh. and people are going to be enjoying re-listening Jackie you never fail to give me a huge smile as I hear in you the voices of my youth that Sheila Ash oh, um, thank you and there's there's lovely 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 comments and we've had so many people join so oh, that's thank lovely. you very very much and I wish you a fantastically fruitful 60s I, I, I turned 60 in, in April and I think it's going to be a good decade Yes, what date in April? 21st. 21st, there you go. Yes, Same think, day as the Queen. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, I think there's something liberating about being at the beginning of your decade. So I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the fact that Good. I'm 60, 60 now. Um, it's been really a pleasure. Thank you so much for, for uh, all your, your questions. It's kind of gone in very, very fast that hour. It's long enough to have cooked my baked potato. <laughs> I hope it's delicious. <laughs> anyway, this uh, this poem. Thank you, everybody, for joining us from from uh, all around the world. It's particularly nice to have somebody there from Spetsy because Spetsy was my mum and dad's favourite holiday place, and they went there at least fifteen times. And I've always I always meant to go. Maybe perhaps I still will go to to Spetsy. And it's good. It's really good to have people joining from 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 Turkey and South Africa and different places in Scotland and England um, and um, so thank you very much everybody that's come along and is here now and thank you to all the people that are going to be here in the future <laughs> this is called um, My Mum is a Robin uh, I wrote this poem in response to a Quentin Blake drawing uh, and it was part of an exhibition at the Foundling Museum that was on recently uh, I find his drawings very very resonant and this one was a child with a bird very very close to her My mum is a robin, so imagine a child's voice, but maybe mine too. I'm pretty sure my mum is a robin, one minute and a wren the next. On Sunday, a wren, a sparrow, tomorrow, maybe a jackdaw on Monday, always flying close, close to me, as if to say, here I am, here I am, my daughter, can't you see me? Can't you hear my song? See me fly near you. Listen to the music of my wings. Sometimes cross. My mum finds a branch close and perches her soft little feet and stares right into my heart, bead eyes, till I look up feet deep in the muddy waters, marshes behind me, and say out loud, in case she can hear me, is that you, Mum? I miss thee. I miss thee. Thank you so, so much, Jackie. That was marvellous to hear, that poem. I'll now be able to read it over and over again with your voice in my head. And thank yeah. you, everyone, for watching. And we are now going to close and go home and have our baked potatoes and our glasses <laughs> of wine or our whiskey or whatever. Oh, yeah, Macris Malt. Oh, yeah, yeah. Show, show, you have, have to show the I assembled. Have a glass of my, yes. my very own malt with my own poem on it. I'm going to have one of them. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, Jackie. And yes. here's to a fabulously productive time ahead. Cheers. Thank Bye. you. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.